Okay, so eye emergencies, this is, you know, anytime you see painless vision loss, you're dealing with a vascular injury of some sort. If it's really acute, they say they woke up in the morning and they have complete loss of vision in one eye, odds are that's a central retinal artery occlusion uh, versus the vein, of course. So that's what we're dealing with here. And, uh, you know, just be aware of the anatomy. You never know if they might ask you to, to tell them kind of which artery is occluded. And the reason that this causes blindness is because it's supplying the territory on the retina where the macula is. So that's that ophthalmic artery. And be aware of the different things that can cause this. Usually the vignette's going to give you uh, some evidence of risk factors, maybe a history of uh, myocardial infarction or peripheral vascular disease. Uh, either way, uh, the most common cause for our standpoint would be, you know, atheroembolism from having carotid stenosis. And somebody who has um, maybe recurrent acute arterial vision loss to their eye like this uh, is someone who actually may need to have a carotid endarterectomy. That's considered to be symptomatic disease if you have carotid stenosis. The other way is if you had a patent foramen ovale or if you had atrial fibrillation and you were throwing emboli from the heart. And the most important one for you to know probably, well, I wouldn't say most important, but one you should be aware of is giant cell or temporal arteritis. And I have a slide about that coming up next. So when we look at the eye in this case, if they give you a picture, you know, once you see this, it's so easy to recognize. Anytime that the retina is not red, but it's pale, that should suggest to you that it's been infarcted. And just like in kids who have Tay-Sachs disease, there's going to be a cherry red spot on the macula, but in adults, or really anybody, that shouldn't be there. And in this case, you see the cherry red spot because, in fact, that tissue is actually white around it, allowing the red spot to show up. So how do we treat it? It's really just going to be conservative stuff, oxygen uh, by face mask, and they want you to massage the eye. Uh, you should not go for gold and pick TPA or some kind of invasive management because that's not recommended yet. So the one exception, like I just you know alluded to, is giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis. And in this case, we're going to give steroids. So here's a picture of it. Like I said, it's actually really obvious now, hopefully, for you. You've got that red, pretty retina in this big area of white spot. That should be, you know, pink or reddish, okay? So with giant cell arteritis, let's just run through this real quick. Uh, big vessel arteritis, uh, the other one's Takiasu arteritis, uh, so it's gonna affect branches off the aorta. And the keys, when you're looking at a question about it, are gonna be people who have recurrent headaches and jaw claudication. They'll describe that to you as someone who's trying to eat food and their jaw sort of freezes up on them and is painful. And on the exam, someone who has tenderness to palpation on the temporal region of the head is pretty classic for this disease. You'll also probably be given some kind of evidence for polymyalgia rheumatica, uh, just stiffness or pain in the joints. Um, and then the lab finding that should ring the bell for this is increased uh, ESR levels. Uh, and this is interesting because these people can have recurrences of this central artery occlusion, but then eventually they may have permanent irreversible vision loss. So the key here is that somebody who comes in uh, like this and they have evidence of temporal arteritis, this is considered an ophthalmologic, an eye emergency, uh, and they need immediate steroids. They need to get control of this disease. So. Uh, just don't automatically knee-jerk and assume that it's some kind of a vascular etiology if the patient has risk factors for giant cell arteritis in the question. In that case, you'd give steroids. So then the other way you could have acute vision loss in one eye is with uh, vein occlusion. And if you have a picture, it's going to be really obvious because it's so different from the artery occlusion. There's no pale spot. In fact, it looks much more red. You got these gross dilated vessels and lots of areas of hemorrhage. Everything just looks really congested and backed up. So it really makes sense. And if they're, if you're lucky enough, they give you good information. This is usually less acute as in they maybe have partial vision loss that progresses to full vision loss or even blurry vision that then progresses to full vision loss. Uh, and this could be the presentation for somebody with an inherited thrombophilic mutation, like a prothrombin mutation or something of that sort. So this could be a sign suggesting to you that the patient may have another abnormality that they're really asking about in the question. Then people with diabetes and high blood pressure are also at risk for this as well, and I'd be aware of that. 
Uh, and then I went through the exam findings with you and that should be hopefully ingrained in your brain now. So then glaucoma, this is the angle closure version that's really bad. Of course you have open angle glaucoma and this is angle closure glaucoma and it is an, an eye emergency. Uh, and you probably remember the physiology of how it happens. There's a rise in ocular pressure and it's usually rapid. And the question usually gives you some kind of reason as to why it happens. Somebody who goes into the movie theater and immediately starts having this pain. Somebody who took any kind of medicine with anticholinergic activity that doesn't have to just be a directly, you know, medicine meant for anticholinergic effect. It could be uh, something like an antipsychotic or Benadryl even. Uh, and then on the presentation, you should have unilateral eye pain and usually a headache on the same side of the head. Um, and classically, they tell you something about the patient seeing halos around the, uh, the lights in the room. And on exam, a fixed mid-dilated pupil. I mean, that's all over the test questions. And that's an exam finding you should definitely try and remember. Hard to the touch is really obvious. If, if you're lucky enough to get that, then you're, uh, you're, you're probably not going to miss the question. Uh, and then tocometry is a term you should be familiar with. It's just a way that you can measure intraocular pressure. So, you know, if they give you an obvious presentation, they won't, may want you to know how to manage it. And we should do that with something that reduces IOP. And you could do that with eye drops like pilocarpine or timolol, or you could use IV mannitol or acetazolamide, both of which just reduce osmolarity in general. Um, acetazolamide causes bicarbonate excretion. So when you're thinking about things you don't want to give to these patients, anything that causes further dilation of the eye is going to be bad. So uh, anything that has alpha, <clears throat> alpha well, I'm sorry, beta, like agonist effects, uh, or anything that has a colon, uh, anticholinergic effect will be very not good to give to these people. So be aware of those as, as things you don't want to pick on the exam. Uh, and then you see a picture of this, uh, you won't forget it, endophthalmitis. This is just a massive infection inside the, inside the little cavity of the eye. And the clue in any time you see this is usually going to be the patient just had surgery recently, a week or two ago. And they need immediate injection of antibiotics into there. They're probably going to have to have the whole eye kind of cut out and debrided. It's not good. Okay, mucormycosis. This is on everyone's exam. I don't care uh, if it was on mine, it's on yours, it's on everybody's. And it's the bread mold fungus and it likes to invade the blood vessels and it does so classically in elderly diabetic patients because this, uh, I'm sorry, this fungus loves high glucose and acidic environments. Now, it could happen in a type 2 diabetic, but presuming that the patient might have type 1 diabetes, this is going to be associated with ketoacidosis. And the clues to this for you are going to be someone who has just severe pain and, you know, the exam is what's going to give it to you because if there's a black eschar, that's really specific for this disease. Black eschar in general is just going to mean necrosis of tissue. And when I hear black eschar, I think surgery and these patients need surgical debridement in addition to amphotericin B. So again, the, the question is going to have to tell you that this patient has a history of, you know, diabetes, they're old, and when you hear severe eye pain, sinus pain in that population, I'd be very suspicious for this disorder. All right, so orbital versus preceptal cellulitis. So one of these is an emergency, the other's not. And you look at these two pictures, I gave you one that is preceptal, the other's orbital. So orbital is an emergency, we want to treat it right away, it's a huge deal. And preceptal cellulitis is really just a superficial skin infection and isn't as much of an emergency. So uh, looking at these two, I think it's really hard to tell. Um, but uh, I'll tell you the clue here. Look at this patient's eyeball. The eyeball in here, you know, doesn't look happy, but it's not proptosed and doesn't necessarily look inflamed. But the eyelid is very red and angry. And then look at this patient. The eyes swollen shut. But look how the eyeball is sort of bulging out through here. This looks like evidence of proptosis. And anybody who has proptosis, or if they tell you the patient has a loss of eye movement, uh, or if they have any kind of vision changes. So like this patient here, I bet you if you open up that eye, uh, got the pus out of the way, their vision would not be affected. So normal vision, no proptosis, 
no loss of extraocular eye movements, that's going to be preceptal. Now, if they have any of those features, that would be a red flag and it's orbital cellulitis. So both, both conditions, eye pain, swelling, redness, okay? So those don't help you. But the key to figuring out orbital cellulitis is what we just talked about. Know those signs right there, have them memorized, and be able to recognize them. If they don't give you the necessary information to discriminate between the two, but they gave you a CT scan result, anything that showed inflammation or evidence of it within the globe itself, like fat stranding, which is usually due to inflammation, or if the extraocular muscles look thick, that would be evidence that you're dealing with an orbital cellulitis. But if they commented that those things were normal, you'd think it's preceptal. So if they did have orbital cellulitis, they need IV antibiotics. We're going to give them vancomycin to cover MRSA and ceftriaxone to cover presumably uh, everything else. And one complication to be aware of with this, amongst others, is a cavernous sinus thrombosis. And the key to that would be they had loss of eye movement and everything on the one eye, and then they progressively developed new onset difficulty moving the other eye, and they have an associated loss of skin sensation in the cranial nerve 5 distribution. That should suggest cranial nerve thrombosis. Now, remember, these patients can also get other complications. They could have uh, abscess, uh, osteomyelitis. I mean, they have a number of other things that can progress into, but just cavernous sinus thrombosis is an unusual presentation, so I thought I'd put it on there for you. So then preceptal is really not as big of a deal. Something superficially uh, inoculated infection there, usually an insect bite. And this can look pretty pretty bad um, if you see it. Uh, the eyes completely can be completely swollen shut, but the inflammation is all in the eyelid itself. And that's the discriminating feature. And then you should give these patients oral clindamycin. I would have that one hard and memorized. Retinal detachment is a challenging thing uh, to visualize. I think the symptoms are pretty obvious when you hear them. So I wanted to give you a picture of it because I think this might help you in case the picture's on the exam uh, to maybe recognize it. And you can see here kind of the, the animated version, but then look at this compared to that. And to me, that makes it help, it sort of helps it make sense. It just looks like the, the ceiling is coming off the roof there, which is really what happens in this disorder. Risk factors for retinal detachment would be nearsightedness. Keep that in mind when you're reading the question. Or somebody who had eye trauma or surgery two or three months before the presentation of detachment, okay? Uh, because it's not going to happen the same day. Usually there's, you know, a couple of months in between uh, this uh, detachment. So the signs are usually pretty obvious. One thing that they don't have is eye pain. They usually have floaters. They think a curtain's coming down over their eyes, and they talk about bright flashing lights uh, or photopsias. So those three things, floaters, curtain coming down, photopsias, blurry vision, that's going to be very, when I hear that, pathognomonic for this condition. Uh, uh, and again, no eye pain. Um, but, you know, when I say that those symptoms are, are so suggestive of this condition, there is one exception, and that is if the patient has diabetes. Somebody with diabetic retinopathy can have vitreous hemorrhage, and that can have the exact same symptoms as a retinal detachment. And we'll talk more about that later. So, uh, and then the surgery for this is going to be laser surgery, and just know that in case they ask you. All right, and vitreous hemorrhage, uh, like I mentioned, it's mainly in diabetes patients. And anytime you hear symptoms that sound like retinal detachment, but you notice the patient has a history of type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes for that matter, you should think about vitreous hemorrhage. The classic exam finding is that you can't see the fundus, all right, because blood is distorting it. And it's important that you recognize that it's a vitreous hemorrhage and not a retinal detachment because the treatment for this is just going to be to let the patient sit up straight and to let that blood drain out. We're not going to give them a laser, you know, treatment, okay? Uh, 